Hello, everyone. Welcome. The stream is now live. If you're watching on the replay, obviously, the stream is now live because that's what you came for. If you are watching this on the replay, you can fast forward 10 minutes and you'll be at the beginning of the study group. Or you can hang out here for the pre-show as I make sure everything is running. We'll run through some cameras. We'll post to the website that the Step Work Network Plus study group is live and put a URL, professormesser.com slash live into the mix. And we'll put it there. And we'll try to get this vocal zone down before the study group starts. Uh, camera check. Camera check. We'll do this. Hi. Hi, everybody. Time for a camera check. That looks pretty good. You just saw camera two. Camera three is what's in front of me. And camera four, I need to start with the presentation. And that is working. And let's go past the first slide. And there we go. Okay. That is all good in the community. Hello, chat room. Hussam B in the chat. I guess a few people are showing up. I guess I could look at my analytics and I would know exactly how many people were here. Let's do that, shall we? There's some folks showing up. I know when I go live, it sends out the update to people that are subscribed. So there is that. So Cranive is up, and I did put a link for Socrative on the live page. Which for some reason, I did not have before. Uh, we can turn this down really low. We could open up, log in here. Oh, I don't like it when their things don't work. Must have sat on the main page for a while. Let's submit that now. There we go. It's supposed to show. And we'll start the show in just a moment. Don't want to show the details of that, though. Sorry, Steve. Yes, I am cutting into your, your slot for other things. We are starting a little bit late today. If you're watching the replay, this makes no sense at all because it's not late for you. Usually we record this at noon Eastern time. Today we are recording it at 2 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time, so two hours later. But we're here now. Things are good now. We're all right now. I know this one could not be avoided. This was one of those where it's just the way it went. In fact, I did these questions last week. I don't even rem remember what I asked. So this will be fun for all of us, really. Uh, let's get rid of this. Let's, uh, what else can we do? That's kind of it. Get rid of this. Why is that even there? What else? What else do we have up here that we do not need to have up here? Um, that. I don't need that. Why are all these things loaded that I don't need? There we go. See how much better that feels? <clears throat> we are uh, for, for six minutes until start time or so, just under. As I work desperately to get rid of this vocal zone. Da, 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 da. I think I've got the things we need. We've got recordings going, recordings going here, recordings going online. We've got, I already did my, my podcast intro, so that part is done. Um, 
You know, we haven't really looked at the bird feeder today. That's something. Something we could do. See how that's going. It's kind of a nice day outside. If my YouTube works, maybe it won't. What am I doing? Looks fine to me. What's it doing? It's spinning. It's spinning. Did it hit the button? I probably did. You know what I was thinking. Dude, what are you doing on my camera? Hear him in there? You definitely need to get out of my camera. There's a, on this bird feeder, there is a camera that's in a birdhouse. So I think sometimes they think, what's he doing? He's trying to break open one of those sunflower seeds or something. You can see him banging it. Like, this will not open. <laughs> Did he get it? Well, the cardinal just wants to scare him off. This is birdfeeder.live. This is the bird feeder that's in my backyard right now. See, it's a nice day. It's a warm day, 88 degrees Fahrenheit, 31.1 degrees Celsius centigrade. Celsius. Celsius. <laughs> Which one is it really? One has to wonder. I was taught both. So that that's not it. All right. Well, let's see what else we got uh, going on here. Uh, three minutes. Three minutes, Mr. Sinatra. Three minutes to post. <clears throat> Busy day for the Cardinals, apparently. Watch some of this, like I am. Turn it up a little bit. Have a nice day, really. Right, look at him open up that sunflower seed. Wish I could do that. Well, I don't know if they're the same birds every day that come to the feeder, but I imagine it is. I mean, they're all in this little area. And no, I don't really, they're not any acquaintances. I don't recognize any of them. Um, we can sometimes see a few in and out that we recognize. We've got a few bird houses spread around. Uh, there's one that's behind sort of to the, to the back left of where this camera is pointing. And there's another bird house on the other side of the yard. And so we do have people that are that are nesting each year. And so we do recognize them because they're going in and out right there of the from the birdhouse to the bird feeder and back. And that's um just we'll take whoever shows up. And it's usually you know different things depending on what time of day it is. Usually don't get a lot in the middle of the day, but we have lately. Like it's lunchtime or something. Yeah, I have tenants. I have to, uh, they don't pay any rent, apparently, um, for some reason. Need to work on that. It's me all paying for them to be here. I pay for their food. I pay for their lodging. Can I pay for all of that? All right. Got a minute to go. <clears throat> See, this is Network Plus this week, isn't it? Need to get uh, with the program. All the scratch of information is on professormesser.com slash live. I will also repeat it annoyingly enough throughout the webcast. So you can't miss it, really. All right. Turn this down just a little bit. We can probably get rid of the birds at this point. And we will uh, kind of get things going. What else do we have here? Uh, we got this. Do I need to have, um, probably do, need to have a thing up here for this. 
There we go. And uh, what else? I think that's it for now. I believe that is it for now. Uh, with that, why don't we get started, everybody? This will be great. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the May 2017 Network Plus Study Group from your friends here at ProfessorMesser.com. I will be your host for this next hour or so. My name is James Messer, and I will be taking you through questions and answers dealing with the topics that you will find on the CompTIA Network Plus exam, focusing on the N10-006. This is something that we do, gosh, every Every month or so, we're doing something like this. We do one of these for A+, plus. we do one of these for Network+, plus. we do one of these for Security+. Plus. There's always something going on here that we like to concentrate on, and we like to have you along as well. If you're here live, you can answer questions in real time. We'll be able to track that. I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. And of course, if you're watching this in the replay, there's no real-time Socrative integration. But you can, of course, still play along and see how you do. This is something that you can always follow us to keep track of what's going on at ProfessorMesser.com slash Twitter slash YouTube. And a lot of people always ask me about voucher discounts. There's obviously a very good discount if you are a student with an EDU account. If you have an EDU email address, you can get almost 50% off your vouchers. You'd have to go directly to CompTIA for that. Uh, find the CompTIA Academic Marketplace. Just Google that. And you'll find the links you need. Uh, but if you are like me and you don't have an EDU account, you can also get a 10% voucher at ProfessorMesser.com slash vouchers. There's a discount code there that can help you there as well. well. I wouldn't be able to do these study groups without your help. There's also an offline version of my course available. For many of you already know, all of my courses are available online to watch for free. But we also have uh, the ones that you can purchase that are the videos that are offline. I have MP3 files that are offline for audio. My course notes come with this. We'll talk about my course notes in a moment. And you can find out all about this at ProfessorMesser.com slash GetNet Plus. A lot of you have also said you want questions and answers for the Network Plus exam. I take all of the questions that we do during these study groups, and I put them online in an online question taking 20 questions at a time. It's kind of nice to go through. You can find these at ProfessorMesser.com slash pop quiz. This is nice to have them online. You can test yourself, see how you do. It's a nice way to get some free questions, too. And I think they're pretty good questions as well because they came directly from our study groups. Speaking of study groups, uh, a lot of people have said, we want an audio version of this. Of course, you can go to YouTube at any time and watch any of the replays of any of my study groups going back years now. But of course, some people would like just audio only. I'm in the car. I don't need the video. I don't need to use the bandwidth. So you can go to ProfessorMesser.com slash podcasts, where I also take all of the study groups and I archive them into podcasts as well. That becomes very handy to have those available. Now, I mentioned today that you will be able to play along. You'll be able to answer the questions along with everyone else, and we'll see how we did. The way you do that is you either open up a new tab in your browser and go to Socrative.com. You can see it listed right here on the screen. You click the student login and go to the room name Professor Messer. You can also download an app for your mobile device. This is the Socrative Student app, and that app will be one where you can have available on your mobile device. You can go to the Professor Messer room, and you just sit there and have that mobile device change and, and allow you to answer the questions as they go along. So either way, all of the details for these are also on the live page, ProfessorMesser.com slash live, where not only is there information about Socrative and all of the information that I just gave you here, but you can also find a chat room there. I'm watching the live event chat as we go by, so you'll be able to see that happen as well. The Network Plus, its current version, here we are in May of 2017, the current version is the N10006 exam. That's the exam version you would take to earn your Network Plus certification. This was something that was released in February of 2015. They usually introduce new versions about every three years. So you're looking into well into 2018 to even think about having this version of the exam go away. So if you're studying right now, you have plenty of time to work on this exam, get all of these things studied. There's no reason to wait. First, my, my, main, uh, my main objective is to get you certified. There's really no good reason to ever wait to get certified, and certainly not for the Network Plus exam. 
Well, if you are in Socrative right now and you have logged in properly, there'll be a question waiting for you. And here's the question that's here. This is not a Network Plus question. This is more of one to see if you're able to get into Socrative and see a question is up on the screen. And the question is that there are over 25 million technical sales and administrative support workers in the United States. What percentage of these people work the night shift? So I'm looking for a percentage between 0 and 100. I'm looking for a number of people that work the night shift. This is a fill-in-the-blank question. So you can figure out and just add it to this list and uh, and put it into this mix. Uh, the night shift's a pretty important shift. And when we deal with things like technology, we know that a lot of these places we work are 24-hour shops. I've worked the night shift before. It's one of those where there, there has to be somebody monitoring, making sure the systems are running. Uh, somewhere in the world, somebody is up and awake. So usually our servers have to be working here as well. So if you can see this question, you can answer the question. That means you're in Socrative properly. If you're not in Socrative, you can go to Socrative.com, click the student login, and try the room name Professor Messer. Make sure you type it in right, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-M-E-S-S-E-R. -S -S -E if you don't type it in right, you won't see this question. So what is the answer? We have all these 25 million people that are working. You can see that 2.1% work the night shift. 3.5% work the evening shift. Maybe not overnight, but certainly later on into the evening. Those come from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And the reason I mention this is today, May the 10th, is National Third Shift Workers Day. So if you have a third shift worker who comes in when you're ready to go home, this would be a day to thank them for what they're doing and having to work overnight to keep all of these systems up and running. Well, I think that's given us a pretty good idea of how we can get into Socrative and work some of these questions and answers. One of the things I like to do on my Network Plus study group as the first question now is to give you something that might simulate or emulate a performance-based question. It's one of these things that allows you to sort of simulate what a real exam might be like. Because when you sit down for your Network Plus exam, the first series of questions you get are not going to be multiple choice questions. They're going to be fill in the blank or matching or something that's close to anything but fill in the blank or anything but multiple choice. So you have this series of questions that may ask you to put things in a particular order. It might ask you to match things up. You might have to fill in blanks. It, it may not be something you're prepared for. So put your mind into that place. I often tell people just to skip over the, the performance-based questions. Go straight to multiple choice, get through all the multiple choice, and then come back to be able to do that. And so here is a very good example of a question that you might get on an exam as a performance-based question. Put these network technologies in order from slowest throughput to fastest. And the technologies are A, OC3, B is T3, C is fast Ethernet, and D is 802.11G. And so you can put these into, I should probably click my button on my side. So now you can put those in through Socrative. Notice you can stay in one place. The screen just changes for you. And now you can type them in. If you think these are already in order from slowest to fastest, then you can just type into Socrative A, B, C, D. And I'll be able to see those answers come up whenever you start putting them in. Maybe you think it's D, C, B, A. It's actually reversed. You could put those in. But you need to put in what you think the slowest technologies would be through the fastest. Make sure as you read through these performance-based questions, you know exactly what they're asking for. And especially a question like this, when you're not quite sure uh, which order it is, make sure you understand the order. Make sure you know what they're asking for. These are pretty important things. Whenever I, whenever I go really fast through an exam, I often will misread things. So it's important that you spend plenty of time reading through the questions very carefully so that you can be able to do that it becomes pretty darn useful to have that there as well. I think that's one where whenever I start working through the problems, I want to really understand. I'll often go back through my questions at the end and realize that I completely misread a question and I was answering it the opposite of what they were asking for. So don't miss, miss one of those opportunities to read it carefully and get a question right that you would have otherwise gotten incorrect completely. So we've got a few people that have typed in what the responses are. Some of you are very good typers. You type the whole thing in. None of this ABCD stuff for you. You typed them in completely. So let's see how we did with this particular set of questions. If I were to put these in order, I would put them in order like this. It would be the first uh, would be B, T3, 
It would be BDCA, T3, 802.11G, Fast Ethernet, and OC3. And I put the speeds out here so we could really see that a T3 would be the slowest at 44.736 megabits per second. Just behind it by only about 10 megabits is, is 802.11G at 54 megabits. Fast Ethernet, what we used to call fast in the world of Ethernet, was 100 megabits per second. I guess it still is, it's fast relative to slower fast ether, slower Ethernet, I guess. We don't really have a slow Ethernet. It wasn't relative. And then OC3 is 155 megabits per second. Each one of these technologies are, are those that you need to know on your exam for how fast or the throughput for these different technologies. They are listed on the exam in the exam objectives as things you need to know. And indeed, this is one of those where you do need to know these. In fact, you'll probably see all of these technologies to some degree. One of the things that you is pretty common with networking is it takes a while to get some technologies out of the network. So even if it's something that's been there as a legacy, we don't want to change it. We really can't change it. We have a system that doesn't understand anything faster than 802.11G, so we can't upgrade to anything faster. So you need to know what these technologies are. And it becomes very common to run into those. So if you answered B, D, C, and A, you got that one right. So in the chat room, you got the first letter right. So now if you didn't get these in order, it's an opportunity to learn something. Now you know something that you need to work on or understand better for the exam. And when you walk in, you'll at least know what these throughputs are at a bare minimum. So think of it that way. Getting it wrong is actually an opportunity because it's a study group. We're just testing. We're just going through this. We're just trying it out ourselves. Let's do another question. This one, thankfully, is a multiple choice question, not a performance-based question. And it is, which of these would be the best way to minimize crosstalk? Which of these would be the best way to minimize crosstalk? Would it be to use the latest set of network adapter card drivers? Would it be to specify multiple DNS servers in your TCP IP configuration? Would it be to use satin cables when connecting to a computer? Would it be to use plenum rated cables on network runs? Or would it be to maintain cable twists close to patch panels and connectors? One of those would be the best way to minimize crosstalk. It's one of those situations with this question where, and, and this is common on the exam, they ask for the best way. They ask to really know what is the best way because there could be in this list of answers, more than one of these might be correct. More than one of these might be a way to minimize crosstalk, but they didn't ask a way, they asked the best way. So it's important that you understand the ideas behind what they're asking for. So that can be pretty helpful to have those there. One of these is the best way to minimize, minimize crosstalk. If you think you know, you can go to Socrative.com to the student login. And you can, of course, put in that it's the room name Professor Messer. You can find out all about crosstalk. So let's see how we did with understanding what we needed for crosstalk. While the rest of you are busy trying to Google that, I will, I'll show you how we're doing. Well, 74% of you said to maintain the table, the cable twists close to patch panels and connectors. 21% said to use plenum rated cables on network runs. And then we got single digits. One in 2% said to use the latest set of network card adapters to specify multiple DNS servers or to use satin cables when connecting to a computer. So what would it be, though? What would be the best way to prevent crosstalk? Well, let's talk about crosstalk first. What is crosstalk, and why is that a bad thing? Obviously, we have inside of our cables four pairs. And for, if we're running gigabit Ethernet, we're running information, we're running signal across all four of those pairs. So we have traffic that's going really four different conversations happening at the same time on that cable. Well, those cables, those wires are very close to each other. And sometimes you'll be able to hear the electricity will seep through the plastic that's there. And you'll be able to hear the information that is coming from another set of wires that's very close to us because they're all really self, really tightly contained within that cable sheath. So one of the things that's important is that we're running a type of cable that is properly shielded, that has the proper characteristics that will minimize the amount of crosstalk between those different pairs. And one of the things that you can do is measure how much of this is leaking 
between these pairs as this traffic traverses and goes from one end to the other. There's some great cable testers out there. Usually they cost a good bit of money that will show you how much crosstalk is there. We commonly will measure the near end crosstalk, the next, because we know if we measure next, it's going to be a, a number that is really relative to all our connections. We're measuring the crosstalk as we're transmitting. We can, of course, measure the crosstalk at the far end, F-E-X-T, for far end crosstalk. But, of course, every cable run in our organization probably goes a different distance. So the far end crosstalk is not something that you can compare to other measurements. You're really comparing it to what you're getting on a single line. That's why you often see here near end crosstalk as being a good way to do that. Uh, the far end crosstalk, not something that sometimes a useful number, certainly, but not something that's very comparable to do. So crosstalk, a, a real problem, because if you have interference, then the signal may not get through as easily as it should. It may slow everything down and require retransmissions. Our data will be corrupted. Everything will slow down in that scenario. So in this case, we looked at, well, we aren't even going to go with the single digits. We'll figure the people that chose the single digits, we weren't quite sure. We were guessing on that. 21% of users said use plenum rated cables on network runs. A plenum rated cable is one that is designed to resist heat and fire. It really doesn't help at all with crosstalk. Now, if, you're, if your crosstalk was being caused by a fire, maybe it would help you. But I don't think crosstalk is your biggest problem in that particular situation. I think probably the fire itself is your biggest concern. So that would not be the best way to minimize crosstalk. Indeed, maintaining the cable twists close to the patch panels and connectors would be a very good way to minimize crosstalk because as that cable is twisting around, it's moving constantly away from that signal that's causing the interference. And we're able to remove that signal on the other end if we're able to work through that. So that's a very good way to minimize crosstalk, to minimize any type of interference on our connections then is to, to maintain those cable twists. Keep the cables twisted as far as possible whenever you're working through that. So that can be that can be pretty useful to know. So if you did answer E, maintain cable twists close to patch panels and connectors, the 72% of you got that one absolutely right. Well done. Let's do another one, shall we? Let's talk about ESD. This is something you'll commonly see on the exam as well, is they'll give you an abbreviation but they won't tell you what the abbreviation means. This is certainly a concern. You have to know how to apply these things. And it's not just knowing what the abbreviation is. You have to understand how it interoperates or works within everything else that we're talking about. So the question here is, which of these would not be a best practice for preventing ESD? Which of these would not be a best practice for preventing ESD? Your possible answers are A, use an anti-static wrist strap. B, connect to an electrical ground. C, do not touch electronic components directly. D, touch the exposed metal chassis before touching a component. And E, touch the edges when handling adapter cards. So this is one where we have to know what the acronym is, and then we have to know how to apply it, and then we have to be able to answer the question. It's something that does come in handy to be able to know these things. So if you think you know the answer, you can go to Socrative.com, click the student login, and go to room name Professor Messer. Remember, no answering in the chat room. We don't want to let that information into the chat room. We're trying to take a guess. And if you don't know, definitely take a guess. You want to be able to do this on the exam, too. Uh, the exam uh, will give you credit if you get one right, but they don't take away points if you get one wrong. So it doesn't hurt to be able to do this. It's something that really can help you as you're going through these pieces. I think that, that can be pretty useful to know these things and be able to work through them. So maybe you know what that happens to be. So go through and see if you can figure it out. Maybe you're able to get rid of things you know is not the, the answer we're looking for. You can kind of get rid of some of these. I'm going to click the uh, and kind of get a feel for this as we go through it. So let's see how we do. We've got a, a good number of people. We're almost at that three digits. 100 people have answered this question. So let's see how we did with which of these would not be a best practice for preventing ESD. Well, we're a little torn on this one, aren't we? We didn't even get the, the exact one and being able to work through it. So let's see how we did. Uh, would it be to use an anti-static wrist strap? 18% said that. 
Uh, well, the winner of this, if you think of a winner, 34% said connect to electrical ground. Uh, number two, 28% said touch the edges when handling adapter cards. 19% said use an anti-static wrist strap. 12% said touch the exposed metal chassis for, before touching a component. And 8% said do not touch electronic components directly. Now, remember, this is something we want to know the best practice uh, for ESD, but we're asking which of these would not be the best practice for preventing ESD. And in this particular case, there's really only one of these that would not be the best practice for ESD. So let's talk about controlling ESD. This is electrostatic discharge. That's what the ESD stands for. Electrostatic discharge can be minimized by keeping the humidity high. If you've ever been in an environment where it's been raining, it's outside, you'll notice that there's not a lot of static electricity that would normally be there. So, But the problem, however, is when you're in an air-conditioned environment, uh, you're conditioning the air. You're removing the humidity from the air. So it's difficult to maintain 60% humidity or more when you're working inside of an air-conditioned building. So that probably wouldn't work. One very common way, if you have nothing else you can do, is use your hand. Touch an exposed piece of metal on the uh, device that you're working on, the computer, the router, the firewall, whatever you're working on. Touch an exposed piece of metal. You might even get a little shock as you're doing that as the electrostatic discharge occurs, but you're touching a piece of the chassis. If you have electrostatic discharge in the chassis, you're not going to hurt the chassis. There's nothing there that you're going to have to worry about. And then you've equalized yourself with everything that's inside of that device. And now you can start working around. You want to, of course, make sure if you're working inside of those devices that you have unplugged this device from any power source. You never want to touch or work inside of these devices when they are connected to power. One common way to keep this uh, in place so that you are always equalized with what you're using is you put a wrist strap on and then use the alligator clip on the other end to connect to that exposed metal chassis. And then you're in pretty good shape if that happens because you're always, always equalized. You never have to keep touching the exposed metal chassis because that equalization will always be in place. And of course, you never want to touch components directly. You never want to touch the electronics directly. You always want to touch the edges of the card for that to happen. So if we look at the responses we got, we know that uh, if we look at 8% said so do not touch electronic components directly, that is a best practice. So that would not be the answer. 13% said to touch the exposed metal chassis before touching a component. That is a best practice. That's certainly good. 19% said use an anti-static wrist strap. Of course you should. 28% said touch the edges when handling adapter cards. Again, that's a great idea. But connecting to an electrical ground is an awful idea. Never, never, never connect to the electrical ground of anything. Never connect your human body to anything associated with the electrics uh, inside of a building. Either it's the electrical ground or, of course, not the electrical neutral and certainly not the electrical hot. You never want to connect anywhere near that power outlet at all, ever. And I mention this because there are both books and training materials that I've seen most recently that show how you should connect yourself to the electrical ground. The problem is that if there is a short circuit somewhere and that device that short circuits is going to take all the electrical energy and send it into the electrical ground, you don't want to be connected to that when that happens. You specifically want to stay away from the electrical ground. So, of course, that would not be a best practice for preventing ESD. 32% of you chose B, connect to an electrical ground. That would be the correct, or as we would say, the really bad response that you got right, which is never connect yourself to anything associated with the electricity that's coming out of those outlets. Just a remarkably bad idea. Well, ESD and the speeds of the throughput and all of the things that we've already talked about are in the Network Plus exam objectives. I highly recommend that you go out to CompTIA and download those objectives. You can Google CompTIA exam objectives. It will take you right to that. You can also go to professormesser.com slash objectives. It will also take you to CompTIA's website and those objectives. But if you look through all of the videos that I have for Network Plus, there is a huge amount of content in these exams. It is extensive. These are not easy exams to get through and plenty of acronyms. If there was ever a time you would be overwhelmed with acronyms, it's on a networking exam because there are tons of acronyms that we use in networking. I've gone through every single one of my videos, and I've taken all of the content and put them into a PDF file for you. These are my Network Plus course notes. They have everything inside of them from the very first 
a set of slides that I have all the way through. I take all the graphics. I take all of the animations that I do. I, I put them into a form that you can read through. If you want to know all of the speeds and throughputs, they're all in the exam objectives. Everything is there. And it's only $10. I, of course, recommend that you get a good book. You, of course, should watch videos. But then at the end, you need something to summarize. And maybe you've taken notes, but you want a little bit extra. You can find out more about these exam objectives at professormesser.com slash NPCN, the Network Plus Course Notes. These course notes are going to tell you everything you need to know from the objectives. They come directly from my videos. And that $10 goes directly back to keeping things running here at Messer Studios. This is something I, I thank everyone who has gotten these so far. Every single dollar from this goes into keeping all of this running and allows me to even make more videos so we can have even more of these coming through. If you want to know more about that, again, it's professormesser.com slash NPCN or Network Plus Course notes. Let's go to another question. We've got another one waiting here. And the question is, which of these would be considered a packet switching technology? Packet switching. Packet, packet switching. So now we need to know mm, packet switching technologies and what they are. Maybe we're able to figure it out based on what the possible responses are. So let's look through those. Uh, a would be POTS or PSTN. Uh, answer B would be a T1. C is DSL. Answer D is ISDN. And E uh, E is E3. Of course, E is E3. Why did I do that? I guess I did that because it was E. E is E3. I should have come up with an A, B, C, D that matched this. But this is close enough. Which of these would be considered a packet switching technology? If you happen to know what that is, you can go to Socrative.com, click the student login, and go to room Professor Messer. If you're not there already, I have a feeling a number of you are because I'm watching the answers come in on my side. Which of these would be considered a packet switching technology? Maybe you guys know which one of these it is. This is one that comes in handy in understanding how all of these work, too. I think all of these would be one that have, uh, I think I've probably seen all of these running simultaneously in a number of different places recently. So this is, again, one of the things I mentioned is that some of these technologies we're looking at go back tens of years, 20, 30, 40 years with some of these, and yet they're still being used in a number of these environments and being able to work through them. So you need to know these as well and, and see if that's really, yeah, you could probably find all of these working. But one of these would be packet switching. So which one is that and being able to work through it? Uh, let's see how we did. Well, before I give you answers with that. Let's see how we did with packet switching technology. Well, we're a little torn on this one, too. 38% of you said POTS and PSTN. 25% said ISDN. 22% said DSL. 7% said E3. And 6% said T1. So pretty, pretty low speed technologies and a low number of people answering them as well. Let's talk about packet switching and how it operates. Packet switching is a lot like what we do on a normal Ethernet network. We're not dialing up somebody to talk to them. There's not a formal calling process. When you want to Google something, you don't have to call Google, wait for Google to pick up, send some data, and then everybody hangs up the phone. That would be more of circuit switching. That's very commonly done with circuit switching. With packet switching, the network is kind of always on. It's always there. And we have devices that are on our network that are able to know where the packets go based on information that we put inside of them. So we don't have to have a formal call setup process to Google and being able to make that happen. We just need to be able to send some traffic out to Google, and it's magically going to get to the other side thanks to the magic of packet switching, being able to work through it. Usually with packet switching, you're even sharing media with other people. Very commonly done when we're on Ethernet, for example, is that we're sending information to Google. A lot of other people are sending information to Google as well. All at the same time, we're using all of this media in a shared format. It's not a requirement for packet switching, but it's very common to see when you're doing packet switching 
We may also see that one connection to a device may have more bandwidth allocated than another connection to the device. Something that we're able to do with packet switching is be able to set how much of the bandwidth certain people are able to use. I know on my cable modem, I, I contract with my cable modem provider. They provide me with an allocation of bandwidth that I'm able to use. But my neighbor next door, who has exactly the same cable provider, they've got exactly the same connection to the network, perhaps bought a smaller package, and they have less bandwidth available. Yet it's all packet switching, very common way to do that. Most of the time, your packet switching will be always on, but it doesn't have to be that way. We're really describing how the packets get between point A and point B, and it's really the call setup process that's missing is the one that we can avoid by using this packet switching. Here's a good example of some packet switching technology, Sonnet and ATM, DSL, Frame Relay, MPLS, Cable Modem, Satellite, and Wireless. Well, there's one of those in that list that absolutely looks like the one that we just looked at. And indeed, if we go through this list, uh, on that list we just saw, we know that POTS PSTN isn't there. We know that ISDN is not in that list. E3 is not in that list. T1 is not in that list. The only one that was in that list is CDSL. So that is the one in here in this entire list of five that would indeed be considered a packet switching technology, would be CDSL. POTS PSTN is our plain old telephone system, our public switched telephone network. Uh, and this is one that is a circuit switched network, not a packet switched network. Don't think that PSTN means that it's packet switched. Uh, this is one where you have to call somebody. You have to type in their phone number and hit go, and then you wait for them to pick up and talk to them. That's circuit switching. T1, also circuit switching, although it doesn't switch very much. Usually T1, we set up a circuit, it's there. But T1 has the capabilities to do circuit switching, even though we don't use them. E3, very similar in that respect. ISDN, another type of technology that's a, that's a dial-up technology. You would call the other side. Their ISDN modem would pick up, and then you can communicate back and forth. It's not an always-on connection either. So DSL is the only one in this scenario. It is always on. There's no formal call set up. It's a packet-switched technology. And that would be the right answer. If you answered CDSL, the 24% of you got this one absolutely right. So this is a good opportunity for the 75% of us, 76% of us that didn't get it right. Now we know the difference. And if we're presented with this on the exam, we're going to nail this and we're going to get it right. It's going to be absolutely correct whenever we answer these and work through them. Let's shift gears to wireless. I have a question for you about wireless technologies. And the question is, which of these wireless technologies does not use 5 gigahertz frequencies? This becomes pretty useful to know, by the way, if you're putting together a wireless network, especially when there's other things around you that could possibly be a problem from a frequency perspective. Would it be 802.11a, 802.11g, 802.11n, or 802.11ac? Which of those do not use 5 gigahertz frequencies? Maybe you know and work through them. This is one you can, of course, answer by going to Socrative.com to the student login. And you'd be able to answer by putting in the room name Professor Messer, being able to work through them. This is one where uh, using wireless becomes important, especially in an environment where you have a lot of people in a very small place, all with different access points, an apartment building, an office building with a lot of tenants. This can be a challenge. So it's important to know what your options might be from a frequency perspective. If you're in that environment, it really helps to have something that can give you an idea of how much frequency is in use. Having some type of spectral analyzer, spectrum analyzer, becomes really important so you can understand how much of what frequencies are in use right now. And this would, might be an opportunity to guess as well. If you're not quite sure, and you can go to this list and say, what do these use? Maybe some of these you do know. So at least throw out the things you think may not be right. Let's see how we did with this one. Well, we are, we've got a 53%. We'll take that as a majority. A 50%. I'm shooting for 50% of you to get these questions right. That's a, the 54%. If that's the right answer, then we probably were shooting in the right place. 802.11g. 54% of you said 802.11g. 28%, more than a quarter of you, said 802.11a. 10% said 802.11n. And 8% said 802.11ac for your 5 gigahertz frequencies. 
So the question, however, was which one does not use 5 gigahertz frequencies? And if we look at the 5 gigahertz frequency range, I've got a lot of things in the slide, but we can really just look at the top top piece. These come directly from my slides, by the way, from my videos. As we're going through the descriptions of these, you'll notice I put the objective number and the name of the video at the bottom of the screen. So you can always see at the bottom of these, this comes from my Inten 006 series, the video 2.7 wireless connections. So you can see that 5 gigahertz used in 802.11a, 802.11n, and 802.11ac, but it's not part of 802.11b or 802.11g. And if we see our list here, you can see that uh, 802.11a was listed as having 5 gigahertz, so that would not be the answer. 802.11n was listed as having and using 5 gigahertz frequencies. That would not be the answer. And then 802.11ac is one that would not have a correct answer either. In this case, 802.11g is one of those technologies that does not use 5 gigahertz frequencies. Make sure in the chat rooms even some of you are hitting your heads over this one, to, the, is that uh, you have to check these questions because they often have that word not in them. These are the ones I always get wrong as well. I always go through this list and realize, no, I got these wrong because I missed the word not. I was reading so quickly through these. So if you have an opportunity to go back through your questions at the end, not just the ones you flagged, but just to go back through and read through all of the questions that you have and check all of them, it's always a good idea. If you go through, you have, let's say you get 90 questions on the exam, which would be the maximum, it helps to go back through all 90 questions if you have the time just to read through them again. And maybe you'll stop yourself and wait a second, I didn't read the not that was in this question last time. Okay, now I understand exactly what they're looking for, and I can click the right answer and being able to work through that. So maybe that's something you will be able to work through as well and have that there. There are, on the Network Plus exam, questions about technologies that deal with uh, things like this, uh, dealing with VPN technologies, the speeds of different technologies, how you would set up TCP IP, how you would configure IPv6, how you would set up pieces for a Soho router. You know, all of these are in the exam objectives. These are very practical things to know. In fact, very useful things to know. And that's why if you're someone who's working on the exam, it becomes useful to be able to go through these and understand them as well. That's why I like what GTS Learning has done with their live labs, where they have set up labs virtually for you to work through. These labs are going to have inside of them a screen that allows you to bring up on your Windows system all of these different pieces. So here's a, a lab I was running, for instance, from a gateway. I was able to run some Wireshark packet captures in their lab. It wasn't even running on my machine. I just had a browser. I didn't have to load any extra software. I didn't have to have anything extra hardware-wise on my system, no additional software on my system, no operating systems loaded, no virtual machines on my side. It's all done in the cloud. And it steps you through the labs step by step with screenshots and explanations so that you can't miss anything. Now, one of the nice things about this is that we've got a nice relationship with GTS Learning. If you go to the GTS Learning website, it's $169 for these labs. But if you're watching this webinar, you can get it for the discounted price of $109. This gives you one year's access to these labs. You can find out all about this on the GTS Learning website, but you have to follow this link to get special pricing. Follow the link at professormesser.com slash netlabs to be able to see the special pricing that they have available. And you'll be able to see the labs like they have set up with the multiple routers and the servers and the workstations and be able to set up IPsec, set up a VPN, run through the TCP IP configuration, and so much more with their Network Plus configurations. Find out more about this. You can ask questions directly of GTS Learning on their website. All you have to do is visit this link, professormesser.com slash netlabs. Maybe that's something instead of setting up your own lab, maybe you'll be ready to go with that as well. A little different than something that you'll have to worry about. This isn't, this isn't like Packet Tracer where you're building a network. You're actually using the network. So that's one of those nice things that you can run into as well. It becomes pretty handy to have that there. So maybe something you can think about as you're stepping through this. Let's do another question. I've got one for you. This is more of a, of a, an image daily double, if you will. 
I've got a question for you that deals with the picture. So maybe you know what this picture is and working through it. The question I have is not what this picture is. And this is very common for the exam. It asks you, which of these would be most associated with this cable type? So you do have to know what the cable is, but then you also have to know how to use it. So I have some options for you. Fortunately, it's a multiple choice question. Would it be cable modem internet access? Would it be building to building connectivity? Would it be international WAN access? Would it be SAN connectivity? Or would it be connectivity between a switch and a router? One of these would be most associated with this cable type. If you think you know the answer, you can of course go through this list and figure this out as well and be able to work through them. I like going through questions like this because you will get questions on the exam that have these pictures in them and being able to work through them. Uh, this is one. I have a better picture of this, too, if we want to see a better picture. There we go. Now we can really zoom up on it. What is this thing that I'm working through? If you think you know, you can go to Socrative.com, to the student login, go to Room Professor Messer. And some of you are already answering the question and having this here. I like, I like that you're able to jump in there and work through these pieces. I like that we're also able to work together and figure out what these different options are whenever we're trying to figure these out. You will absolutely run into these cable types if you do any type of networking. It comes seems to be that we're always using them for one thing or another to have that there. Some of you are mentioning Packet Tracer. Packet Tracer well beyond the requirements for Network Plus. That's a Cisco product commonly used for their Cisco early uh, introductory Cisco certifications. Uh, you would never need to even even approach what you would need to use Packet Tracer for, for something like Network Plus and being able to work through those. So let's see how we did with this one. A number of you are Googling madly to try to figure this one out. I can always tell when the numbers don't spin up very quickly that you're really thinking this one over. And by thinking this one over, I mean you're trying to Google it desperately and be, being able to work through them. So let's see how do we do with this one. Well, 52% of you. If we're always hitting that 50%, that's what I'm usually shooting for, if that's the right answer, would be A, cable modem internet access. 23% of you said building to building connectivity. 8%, well, let's see, 9%, that would be number three, said SAN connectivity. But it's basically tied for third with SAN connectivity, international WAN access, and connectivity between a switch and a router. So that does come in handy to know these. Now, this, this becomes a little bit more of a challenge. What is this then? And what would we do with this? Well, this connector is a BNC connector. A bayonet, that's the type of connector it is. Bayonet is a connector that you push in, and then it twists, and it locks in place. We call that a bayonet connector. And this bayonet connector was created by Paul Neal and Carl Councilman. They were at Bell Labs and Amphenol, respectively. This is a coaxial cable connector which means whatever we're plugging into this is going to be a coax cable, which means a single copper connection inside. Uh, although there are a number of BNC connectors use multiple copper connectors inside of that. Uh, very common to see something like RG58, for instance, used in uh, TimBase2, the older Ethernet. Usually now we see them being used on something like DS3 WAN links. So if you have a DS3 or an E3 WAN link coming in, it's probably being provided to you over a BNC connection. That's usually the connection type that's commonly used. These are, uh, because they're coax, they're very rigid. It's kind of difficult to work with. It doesn't go around corners very well. You really have to plan out where you're going to put these. I use these type of connectors in my studio because all of my video is being run on BNC. It uses a digital over these BNC connectors, a very standard video type that's here. Not really what we'd see on the Network Plus. On the Network Plus, commonly, DS3 uh, and, and E3 type connections, very commonly used for this. So if you're, you're plugging these into a connection with that, what type of connectors would it be? Well, if we look at what we were doing, 52% said cable modem internet access. You would never use this type of cable with cable modem internet access. You do have to look very closely at this. A lot of you, I think, may have thought that was an F connector, but it was not this the screw-on type connector at the end. You can see the bayonet connector is even there. You can almost see the, the divots that are in the connector that lock in that bayonet in place. So it would not be 
Cable modem internet access. 25% of you said building to building connectivity. Almost always building to building connectivity we're doing with Ethernet or with fiber these days. This is neither an Ethernet connection and it's definitely not a fiber connection. We can even see the copper is in the connector itself. We can see that there's the copper connector right in the middle of that coax that's coming out. So really not commonly used for building to building connectivity, almost never used for building to building connectivity. Let me be clear about that. 10% uh, said SAN connectivity. SAN connectivity usually requires very high speeds. It's usually running over gigabit, usually over even fiber connections, because we really want to be sure the throughputs are very good with a storage area network. So that would not be the right answer either. 8% said connectivity between a switch and router. That's almost always done with Ethernet, never done with a, a BNC type connector, which means the lowest number here of answers was 7% international WAN access. And that's actually the right answer. A DS3 connection or an E3 connection, that's a wide area network connection. And that's one that is the right answer. If you were the 7% that answered C, international WAN access, then you got this one absolutely right. So this is one where, as I mentioned, it's not enough to know what this is. Oh, that's a BNC type connector that's on the end of this coax cable. Well, that's great, but what do you do with it? How does that mean anything and being able to work through it? So this is what is you what it, you mean by it. This is how you use it. And that's what the exam is going to be looking for as well and being able to work through that. Yeah, you 7%, even if you were guessing, even if 7% of you absolutely took a stab at that, you took a stab, you got it right, which is really the most important part. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good and working through those. Uh, this is one, by the way, that if you're watching this study group for uh, continuing education unit credit, you've already got your Network Plus exam and you're accumulating continuing education units, then this might be something that you're able to do. Now, if you don't have your Network Plus certification, these CEUs won't help you. But if you already have your certification, this is what you want to do. You go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website. There's a Contact Us link at the top of the bottom. You want to click that. And on that Contact Us form, you want to put that this is the May 2017 Network Plus Study Group. You want to give me your name and your email address, because I need to send this back to you. It's helpful if I have your name in it as well. And you want to give me the special code word of the month, which is BNC. So this is the one where we want to know this code word of the month, BNC. There it is. Uh, this BNC connector is then, I'm going to get this response from you. I'll see BNC or BNC connector. I'm the one reading these as they come through. So you can also put whatever else you want in that note. I like to read the notes that you send. Uh, and I will send you back a, a effectively a digital certificate. I'm sending you back an email that I will digitally sign that said, indeed, you must have watched this. I'll give you an hour of webinar credit for your CEU and being able to work through it. So uh, make sure you're able to follow those instructions. I don't provide you with a CEU unless you follow those instructions perfectly. That's part of earning the CEU is that I know you must have watched it. You must know the process because I just told it to you. Uh, if you have your A-plus certification, networking is part of A-plus. It applies to that as well. If you have your security plus certification, networking is part of this it would apply to that as well. So it will work with any of those. If you just need CEUs, that's a great way to do it. And you just follow those instructions. And I will be glad to provide those to you as well. Skip ahead now. We can probably fit in a couple more questions, can't we? I've got some more here. We can work through that and being able to work through all of those different pieces. Here's another question for you. And Judy, I've not changed the email templates for my CEU replies, no. And it's not automated. It's me doing the CEU replies. I sit in front of the TV, and I go back and forth and being able to work through those. So here's your next question. A user is communicating between VLANs without authorization. Shame on them. Which of these techniques would be the most likely explanation for this communication? Which of these would be the most likely explanation for this communication? And I've got some options for you. Would it be MITM? whatever that is? Would it be session hijacking? Would it be social engineering? Would it be double tagging? Or would it be DOS? So it's one of these. Some of these are abbreviations again. Again, with the abbreviations and being able to work through them. I got to wonder, all these abbreviations, what it might be. Maybe you know what this is. Maybe you've done this communication between VLANs without authorization. Shame on you. You should not do that. And on a good network, you probably wouldn't. We probably would be mitigated 
on a good network. But if you think you know the answer, you can go to scratov.com. You can click the student login and go to room name Professor Messer. This is another one of those, by the way, that is this multiple step. You notice all of my questions almost always have multiple steps associated with them where I present you with an abbreviation or a scenario. And I'm not asking you what the scenario is. I'm asking effectively how you got there or where you go from here. That the exam is almost always how did you get to this point or what do you do from this point? It's, it's asking you to perform some type of function, some action based on what you know. And that's how you really know if somebody understands the material is not if they can reply back of what an abbreviation happens to be, but they know how to use that in a practical form. And you'll see that all the time on the Network Plus exam. So maybe this is another good example of something practical. You know now somebody's communicating between VLANs. They're not supposed to be communicating between VLANs. How are they doing that between these VLAN connections? Maybe, maybe. So let's see how we did. Some of you are Googling desperately, so I'm going to put you out of your misery, and we're going to see how we did. Again, we're torn. We're torn between really three different options, I think. So uh, if we go to the highest number, 38% said double tagging. Close behind, almost a tie for first at 35% is session hijacking. And then we drop way down to 19% MITM, whatever that is. 8% says social engineering. And single digit, 1% DOS, D-O-S. And that doesn't mean disk operating system, does it? So which one of these would it be? What would cause someone to communicate between VLANs without authorization? As, as you might think, uh, this is a pretty bad idea. VLANs helps us to segment the network, not just functionally between this, but also I want to be able to keep some type of security between these VLANs. VLANs should not be able to communicate between each other unless I say they should. As the security professional, as the networking administrator, this is pretty important to be able to work through that. So you want to be, if you've got the, uh, the network engineering team is on one VLAN, the security team is on one VLAN, accounting is on one VLAN, shipping and receiving is on a VLAN, you don't want to be able to hop between those VLANs. So this is something that's a little bit more of a challenge. And obviously, to move between VLANs, you should be going through a router or a Layer 3 device like a firewall to make this happen. We're seeing more and more people putting firewalls in to separate their VLANs so that you really can have very finite, very very uh, uh, detailed analysis or, or control of traffic that's going back and forth between all of those. So if you're staying on your VLAN, that's a pretty good idea. But if somebody's able to hop to another VLAN, that's a bad idea. Something's not, not right there. That should not be happening. Nobody should be able to move between VLANs unless you're routing them yourself between those VLANs. So there's usually two primary methods to, for this to happen, or two very common. I wouldn't say primary, but these are probably the most common ways that people Find ways to move between VLANs when they really should not be. One of them is switch spoofing, and the other one is double tagging. Now, in my videos, you'll see I've listed here. This is a video from my N10006 series uh, in section 3.2, which corresponds to the exam objective 3.2. And this video is called VLAN Hopping. If you wanted to go into the detail of what these two things are, what is switch spoofing, what is double tagging, this is exactly to be able uh, how you would do that, work through them. So if we look at the different options we have available, only one of these made sense in being able to have that there. And indeed, double tagging, 35% of you, the second highest that was answered here was double tagging. So that was the, the correct answer was D. Would it be MITM? That stands for man in the middle. Being able to put, to put yourself in the middle of a communication is something very commonly done by the bad guys, but it doesn't somehow get you to another VLAN. That's not something that really helps to be able to have that there. So that's not something commonly done with man and mill. Certainly not the most likely explanation given the options that you have available. 38% uh, said session hijacking. Again, you're simply using the session that somebody else had already set up to a server. That doesn't necessarily allow you to hop between VLANs either. So that's not really going to work. 7% said social engineering does nothing to get you between VLANs. And denial of service probably was shut down the VLANs there. That's one of the challenges you always run into uh, is that you don't want to break it. You're just trying to get to another side. So the only real option, the most likely explanation here is indeed double tagging. 36% of you almost tied for first 
we're almost at that 50% level, aren't we, to get that one right? So maybe now that you know about these ideas and what people do to be able to get between different VLANs, that's a very good way to do it. So it's something you can think about whenever you're planning through these different ideas. Let's shift from VLANs and move into more wires. Let's go back to the wiring side of things. So I have a question for you. This is more of a troubleshooting problem with the wires. And your question is this. A wire map on an Ethernet patch cable checks out to be normal, which means pin 1 is connected to pin 1, pin 2 is connected to pin 3, pin uh, pin 2 is connected to pin 2, pin 3 is connected to pin 3, 4 to 4, 5 to 5, et cetera, et cetera. That's a normal patch cable, right? Everything is a straight through patch. That's what we're looking for. So that, that checks out. However, there is excessive near and crosstalk when testing. See how I used that abbreviation name? I kind of gave you a hint there. There's excessive next when testing. Which of these would be the most likely reason for this? So we're working through this and trying to figure out why would we be getting near and crosstalk on a cable that seems to be in good shape? Let's see what our possibilities might be. And we have a, a finite number here. We have, a, have five options available. Is it that the cable has a short? Is it that the cable has split pairs? Is it that one end is 568A and the other is 568B? Is it that the cable has an open? Or is it that transmit and receive is reversed? One of these would be the most likely reason to get next when testing. So if you think you know the answer, I think some of you might. You would go to Socrative.com to the student login to room name Professor Messer and be able to answer this one. And I think this if you haven't done a lot of troubleshooting with cable, this one might be a mystery for you. Some of you have run into this, though. It's a, it's a real stumper. And everything looks OK, but we still got a problem. Why is that? And of course, it could be many, many different things. And this is where you have to think about this on the exam. This particular problem might be, and off the top of my head, I can think of 10 or 15 things that might be causing this. But those 10 or 15 things are not listed as the answers. Only one of those things out of those 10 or 15, only one of them is listed as the answer. So that must be what it is, because we're asking of these, what would be the most likely reason? The exam isn't going to offer you all 15 possible things and tell you which is most likely. It should jump out at you. It should be very obvious when you're working through these questions what it happens to be. So let's see. A lot of you are trying to figure out what this could be. I can tell. A lot of you are. A lot of you have checked out. I've given you some hard questions here near the end. I started you off easy, and then we got a little progressively harder as we went through the list. So let's see how we've done answering this one. Well, we are, we're just all over the place. Uh, we do have a one that's clearly number one, though. 40% of you said the cable has split pairs. 24%, though, right behind it, said the cable has a short. And then we're almost tied for third with the cable having an open, the other end 568A and the other end 568B, and then transmit and receive is reversed. But if we go with, it's not a majority, but if we go with the number one answer is that the cable has split pairs. So let's uh, split pairs. We got split pairs on the board. Survey says it is on the board. Split pairs. Split pairs is a wiring mistake. You set up a wire, you do your cable test, and all of the cables match up. One pin one goes to pin one, pin two goes to pin two, pin three goes to pin three. It's exactly the scenario I presented you with. But you're going to have problems with near and crosstalk. There's going to be crosstalk between these. And not just a little bit of crosstalk. There's going to be some bad crosstalk between this when there is a split pair. So the problem is that you have split these pairs and you've kept it consistently split from one end of the cable to the other, which is why the wiring map looks this way. Here's how it really turns out to look. If you look at it physically, you can see, for instance, pin 1 goes to pin 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3. Notice that, though, you have these pairs set up. And it's this blue pair here. Notice that the blue and white, number 5, does go to 5. The blue is supposed to go to number pin 4, but it doesn't. Blue instead goes down to pin 7. And the brown and white on pin 7 is now connecting to 4. Notice how they're split, but they're split exactly the same on the other side. And that's why our wire map's working properly. But we're getting some of the signal from the brown is on the blue, and some of the signal on the blue is on the brown. 
And that's why when we do a near-end crosstalk test, wow, the brown and the blue is really noisy between each other. What in the world is happening that we're having this particular problem? It's because you have split pairs. That's where the problem is occurring. So the 41% of you that said the cable has split pairs, you got it absolutely right. That is exactly the scenario we ran into here. If the cable had a short, that means that two wires are connecting to each other. They're touching each other. Then we would see that on the wire map. Pin 1 might connect to pin 1 and pin 2. Well, that would be a bad wire map, wouldn't it? And that's obviously not the wire map that we got. One in having 568A and the other having 568B would also not show a proper wire map because pin 1 might go to pin 3. And pin 2 would go to pin 2, but pin 3 would go to pin 1. You'd see different entirely depending on how you want to split those out. The cable having an open, an open is when it's disconnected completely. So pin 1 might go to pin 1 and pin 2 might not go anywhere. That's an open. There's a break in the cable somewhere in that connection. And transmit and receive being reversed is something where you also would not have a pin 1 to pin 1 and pin 2 to pin 2. You would see differences there. So in this case, you could step through all of the things that you know would cause a difference to the wire map and immediately throw them out, even if you didn't understand why the near and crosstalk was happening. The only option here that jumps right out at you, there really is no other option, is B, the cable has split pairs. That is the correct answer. If you're one of the 40% of you that answered that one, you did get that one absolutely right. It's so important that you follow the exam objectives in the CompTIA uh, N10006 exam objective list. This tells you everything you need to know in the exam. And this is a common question I get is, is there a particular part of the exam that's more important than others? Yes, there is. And they are all listed in order of importance in the exam objectives. Now, it turns out everything on the exam objective is really important. But it does tell you that section one, you'll have a certain percentage of questions on the exam come from section one, a certain percentage from question two, a certain percentage from question th uh, from uh, section three, and so on. So make sure you download and use these exam objectives. They are a great checklist before you you're able to go into your exam. You want to know if you're ready? You can check off everything on this exam objective. You're ready. It is the most comprehensive set of exam objectives that you'll probably get in your entire IT career. Nobody else really does it this way but CompTIA. It's a, and you should take advantage of that. They're laying it out for you. You can't help but pass. You've got everything right in front of you. You'll know if you're ready to take the exam because you're able to go through exactly these objectives. Very, pretty important to have that there. Well, we do one of these Network Plus study groups every month. We've got another one of these happening in June. Uh, June the 14th, 2017 will be my next Network Plus study group. Uh, of course, I do another study group next week. That's my Security Plus study group. Um, if you're ever wondering, if you're watching this on replay and we're past June the 14th, you have no idea when the next event might be, you can always go to the calendar that's on my website. You can click the calendar link at the top or go directly to the calendar by going to professormesser.com slash calendar. Well, our first hour is over. Can you believe it? There was a lot of questions we went through in one hour. But I stick around for another hour. I'll open up the phone lines. You're welcome to call in. I have questions in the chat room. You're welcome to put questions there. We can talk about uh, any of these questions we went through today. Or it's an open phone line. You can talk about anything that's going on. I'll be glad to answer any of the questions you have. Don't forget about our links on Twitter and YouTube by going to professormesser.com slash Twitter. ProfessorMesser.com slash YouTube. You can, of course, follow us and subscribe there. Network Plus course notes, don't forget about those. That might help you by going to ProfessorMesser.com slash NPCN for the Network Plus course notes. We also have all the, the GTS Learning Live Labs. It might be something that interests you. You can find out about those at ProfessorMesser.com slash NetLabs. And don't forget about watching any one of these study groups every month. We're here to help. You can find out more at ProfessorMesser.com slash calendar. And of course, thanks to you, I would not be able to do these study groups without your ongoing support. Stick around for the hour number two. I'll open up the phone lines. Otherwise, we will see you next month on the Network Plus study group. Thanks, everyone. OK. That was a lot of questions there. We have got through quite a, quite a few on that one. I'm pretty pleased. A lot of you have said, I wanted more questions. It's kind of a balancing act, though. I want to get through more questions, but I want to be sure we cover all the content here as well. 
and having them there. I agree. For the chat room, I was talking about the exam objectives. Yeah, you don't get these with Cisco. They don't give you a lot with Microsoft. They don't give you a lot with VMware. It's not even close to being the same. You kind of have to go to, to Cisco's book or Microsoft's book to really know what's going to be on the exam because I think whoever's writing the book must get a little more insight on what's happening. At least I hope that because that's where I usually go. I go to their book. And sometimes their book is a dry book. It's just not a great book. But you don't have a choice. You really should go to their book. It just makes sense. So let's open up the phone lines. Thanks, RD, for joining. Some folks are having to drop off. That's fine. I appreciate that. I, I feel you. Let's uh, get these phone lines open, though. There's no big crew of people. This is me. This is me opening up the phone lines and having it here. I need to open up my uh, my Skype. Uh, Skypey. There we go. And get the Skype going. Zoop, and move it over to a screen and call in myself so that I can give you the phone number to call in. See, some of you are already calling in before I'm even there. How does that happen? Uh, type this in and push this thing here. Enter your six-digit PIN number. All right. I think I might be able to change those prompts. But then I wouldn't be able to complain about the fact that six-digit PIN number is redundant every single month. Whoa. Don't want to. I'm trying to get... Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get my screen set up here. I did something very bad on my screen. You can see I'm trying to get it right. Here, yeah, whoa, here we go. Whoops, whoops. Okay. Something bad happened. Bad. Something very bad happened, people. That's pretty close, I think. Without me having to punch things up, that's pretty look, this is all wrong. That's not even close to being right. And having that in the mix. I have no idea what I've done with that. Let's go and fix that. V1. That needs to be a different thing at the bottom. There we go. See, now we got the right number there. If you want to call in, you're more than welcome to call in. The phone number, 855-785-RJ45. You can also call in on Skype without using Skype minutes. Oh, and it's set up to mix. I don't want autoplay. There we go. Let's see if I can get this in the right side again and get my, my graphics set up properly. Uh, you can, of course, call in on these numbers. There we go. On the from Skype. So being able to work through that. Uh, Skype is free. We put a plus one, 855-785-7545, and that will get you through here. Absolutely free on Skype. And we can go straight to the phone lines at the 571 area code. Are you there, caller? What's your name? Uh, my name's Eric. Hey, Eric. Thanks for calling. What can we do for you? So I'm taking the exam um, tomorrow, and um, I think I'm pretty strong on everything. But one thing I'm kind of weak at is the submitting part of it, which I think a lot of people are. Um, so my plan, I looked on Reddit, and they kind of tell you what questions are been asked. And some people are like, there's not one or two, and some people are like, there's four or five or six or whatever. So my plan was just to ignore submitting altogether and just be strong everywhere else. But I watched your seven-second submitting video. Yes. And I guess what confused me, do we have to basically memorize the chart that you um, put on the uh, the video and then write that down as soon as we get in? Or or how's that work? If you can just explain that a little more. You do. I, I mentioned it very quickly in the video. In fact, I even tell people to bring your own fine-tipped erasable marker because they're going to give you an erasable sheet of paper to use. And they usually give you some big fat marker that you would use to create a football poster. Not sure what they're thinking. Um, but that's one where uh, you do have to write out the chart. It's one of the, the things about that particular uh, method of doing subnetting is I wanted to show people a method that required no math. And that's what the seven-second sub subnetting is. I, I fully expect some people may not use every aspect of what I put in the video. They'll customize it to however they want to do it themselves. But your question is an important one because there's a couple of very important charts you have to have to be able to make that work. And yes, you have to write them down yourself. They're going to give you a blank sheet of paper, and then you have to write down everything that's in those charts and have them available. And that's why at the beginning of the video, I show you how I built the chart specifically so that you could build it that way by doing a couple of multiplications and having them multiply by two and having all of those different charts up and ready to go. That's a requirement. Now, for what's on the exam, if you look at the exam objectives, subnetting 
not mentioned a lot. In fact, if somebody uh, was first, people should not be saying how many questions of what type they had on the exam, because that would be a violation of their candidate agreement. But I find it rem un very unlikely, given the amount of subnetting that's listed in the CompTIA exam objectives, that you would ever get more than two or three questions. If you just do the math, statistically, there's no way they could ask you six or seven subnetting questions. There's not enough of that in the exam objectives to be able to do that unless you got a really bad roll of the dice. I mean, that had to be a pretty bad one. Some, I would think some people get zero because it's so it's not really listed in the exam objectives at all. I think maybe some people as well think that subnetting is knowing what class an IP address happens to be. That's not subnetting. But I think maybe some people are putting it in that category. And maybe that's where they're getting their higher numbers from. And I, I think your strategy is not a bad one. It's one that I've given myself in these study groups is if you get stuck on a particular topic, skip it. There are many other topics on the exam that you will run into. If you don't study one of them, it might be asked of you on the exam. But if you've spent that time studying other things, then you'll hopefully be able to make it up in other places on the exam. So it's not a bad strategy, probably not the first strategy I'd go with. I'd, I'd hope that most people would learn subnetting, but I absolutely understand that people can get wrapped around the axle. Your exam is tomorrow. I would concentrate on other parts of the exam first, maybe talking about what a BNC connector might be connected to, for example, instead of worrying about how to do a subnetting and spending all night trying to do powers of two or magic number or seven second subnetting, just forget it completely. And you're right, go figure out something and spend your time studying where you can learn something else for the exam and have it ready to go. All right, thank you. I bet. Thanks for calling, Eric. That's a, a common question. And good, good for you for, for thinking that way. Taking an exam is as much about style as it is about substance sometimes. Uh, you have to have a strategy going in. That's a pretty good strategy, I think. Uh, let's go to the 904 Erie Code, my neck of the woods. Uh, sounds like a North Florida caller. Are you there? What's your name? Yes, hi. My name is Nicholas. Hello, and Nicholas. I have, like, I have like three, four questions, but it's all in the same area. Well, we'll see what we can do. And my question is, my question is, um, I understand everything in networking, but except for the business continuity part of it, and is what is business continuity and the difference between those of disaster recovery and risk assessment? And the last question, are those forms that you have to fill out in the real world? Oh, well. There's, there's the something that when you start wrapping around all of the things that are non-technical, those certainly fall into that category. And for me, uh, right. as someone, I, I like the technical side of networking. I really hate the management process procedure side of it. And quite honestly, that's right. one of those sides of networking that you just can't avoid. It's something that you'll find in every yeah. organization you go to. It's something that's going to have... Um, absolutely an impact on how you do your job. And, and so, so I'll, I'll give you the same advice somebody gave to me when I was talking more about po politics, office politics. I said, this office politics is driving me crazy. I can't handle it. And he said to me, it's not about office politics. You're going to have politics everywhere you go. It's how you handle it. That's right. the difference. So you're going to have these scenarios, these uh, the the keeping the business up and running, having uh, testing and and uh, redundancy in your network, having a process for change control, having a process for integrating a new application or an application change, and doing disaster recovery are all going to be part of whatever job you go into, and it, and they're usually going to be expensive too. It's a, doing disaster recovery is not a cheap thing. So you have to put a lot of money into it. So there's going to be a big emphasis in it, no matter where you go. Um, so ultimately, the business continuity deals with making sure everything stays up and running. That a very, It's a very broad term that really describes keeping the business running. Now, that could be uh, keeping the network 100% available, which is unlikely, or setting up a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, should something happen. And when you start getting into redundancy equipment, see, people say, why do I need two routers? Why do I need two firewalls? Why do I need two core switches? 
and you get to answer the question with, you want to stay up and running. If we lost our firewall, this is how long we would be down and how much money we would not be able to make or how much money we would lose in that time frame. So you can make a business decision about those technologies. Uh, being disaster recovery is another good one. 904 Erie codes, probably Florida. So hurricanes are going to come through. How, what happens if our hurricane comes through? And in, in, in where I live last year, our hurricane came through. It didn't really destroy any of the buildings. We still had all of our buildings. Nobody's house was really crushed or blown away. It wasn't that bad of a storm, but it was bad enough that power was down for some people for seven days, for a week. Now, what would you do in your business if the power was down for seven days. Now, if you're a hospital, that's a pretty big deal. That's a significant, that's a serious deal. It's a serious problem. So you'd probably spend a lot more money as a hospital on disaster recovery from electrical and water and everything else than you would probably your network connections. Uh, but if you're somebody like an ISP, then probably keeping electricity running and keeping uh, the building and communications in place is probably the important thing. So that's whenever you get into that part of the exam, make sure you read through each one of those very carefully. You understand the differences and that you're able to not only understand the scope of it, but in, and you ask the question, am I going to run into these forms and these things in a real environment? Absolutely. Change control is a very common thing. It's a weekly occurrence. Everybody has a change control meeting. As a network person, you as, as probably the introductory, you're, you're new to the team, you've got to go to change control meetings. And so people will present, hey, on Saturday, we're going to be updating this thing. I want to make sure everybody's aware of it. Oh, is that going to, is that going to impact the network? It probably is. I need to be involved with that. I need to understand what's going to happen. Do we need to work around it? That's that's a normal business, and it's an important part of keeping things running. Thank you. That was pretty great. It's I, guess, uh, it's, I understand it a lot more. I got to tell you, it's painful. I hate the process, the procedure, and the business side of it, but it's an incredibly important side of it. And if you do it well, you actually have kind of a leg up on other people because they don't like doing it either. So having a, a big, a good knowledge right. of the process procedure, I used to live in Miami, Hurricane Andrew came through, uh, we implemented disaster recovery, we switched everything from Miami to Minnesota overnight. That's a big deal. And uh, being a part of that really helped me understand, okay, this is really important. Uh, we were an insurance company, even though Miami was out of business, and they weren't so concerned about their insurance, other parts of the country were. And that was an important thing to keep whatever they were doing in their life going. We needed to be available for them. We were their provider. We were there providing that service for them. So it, it ultimately comes back to people. And that's the way I approached it from going forward. It helped me humanize it a little better and understand why it was so important. Seems like a really important deal. That's all I had. That was all my questions. Thanks for calling, Nicholas. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Run into that a lot, though. If I if I could put if I could take technology and just put a face on it and humanize it, it just goes so much better. And working through those pieces and understanding it. Uh, let's go to the five five nine area code. Are you there, caller? What's your name? Hello, this is Kivias calling from Zambia. Hey, welcome. What can we do for you? I just appreciate uh, your content. I've been uh, following uh, you. On uh, YouTube and uh, those nice videos, the tutorials, I like them so much. They are keeping me up for for what I'm looking forward Thank to. Thank you, sir. Very as welcome. As far as IT is concerned. Sure. Uh, but just one question. In some countries like in Africa, it's not easy to find uh, visa facilities where they offer, uh, let me say, even colleges or universities where sure. uh, exams are offered. In such a case, how can someone register and the sit for such an exam it, it is a challenge it's not even just a challenge in africa but in other geographies where there's just not a lot of 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 municipalities nearby there's not a lot of big cities nearby and we have the similar problems in the united states perhaps not as spread out as it is in other parts of the world but there are places in the u.s where you have to get in a car and drive for hours just to take an exam um, this is this is a, uh, a it used to be this was insurmountable. You really couldn't get around this type of problem. One of the things you'll find though is CompTIA, at least CompTIA is addressing this, uh, and they're doing uh, a new set of 
testing that can be done remotely. Uh, CompTIA is calling it their Anywhere Proctor Test Delivery System. And it's a neat idea because they have taken, they haven't taken their A plus and their Network Plus and Security Plus exams yet, but you can do this with their IT fundamentals and their cloud essentials. I think they also put Project Plus on it as well, although the website doesn't show that yet. And what they're allowing you to do is take the exams, the certification exams, on your computer, on your laptop. All you need is a network connection. And they have somebody connect to your camera. There's a set of requirements that they have. So they have a third person, a proctor, connect to your system. This You've probably done this with a remote desktop before, or even with Skype, where somebody can see your screen and you can see them in the camera. And they, they you show them the room with your camera so they can see there's nothing in the room that's giving you notes. And uh, they can see your screen, so they can see you taking the exam. And they can see you through the camera, so they can see that you're not flipping through a book whenever <laughs> you're trying to answer a question. Uh, and, and it's a great way to do it because you can sit it in somewhere that's very comfortable for you. You can maintain uh, a very known environment. There's not a lot of loud noises. You're not in a workplace where other people are. You're not in a room with other test takers, which can sometimes be distracting as well. You do everything on your computer. Um, and you, it's all handled exactly the same as if you were sitting in an exam center. Like I said, they they aren't doing A+, plus, Network+, plus, Security+, plus quite yet with this. They're working with a third party to make this happen. Uh, but it is one where uh, it, I, I think it's a pretty good idea. I have a feeling. I know, I know nothing about what CompTIA's plans are with this. But I have a feeling, given the way they're rolling it out, that this is the first step. And I think what they're going to do is add more and more and more of these to their list. So maybe what they're happy with how this goes, maybe they'll add some more to this. Uh, I guess if they're not happy with it, we won't see anything happen. But I haven't heard any horrible stories about this yet. I'm hoping to get more people telling me, here's how it went, and everything went OK, and there weren't any technical glitches, and they felt very positive about it. And if that's the case, maybe we'll see more listed out that way. I think it'd be great not just for you, but for other people as well. Thank you so much, Professor. So as someone who is new in the industry, which certification would you like to encourage someone to take first? It's a tough question to say. Um, and I get this question all the time. Here's a <laughs> list of three or four certifications. Which one should I get? Here's A+, plus, here's Network+, plus, here's Security+, plus, here's CCNA uh, routing and switching. Here's some Microsoft. Which one should I go get? Um, and I can't answer the question. In uh, it, it's difficult because okay. so every environment's different. Uh, mm -hmm. Every employers are different. Uh, people want, have different goals and requirements for what they want to do in life. Uh, and there may, in your geogra uh, geography, uh, people may be very focused on Microsoft certifications. In a different geography, they may not care about Microsoft. They might want Linux more than anything else. In other geographies, they may be more concerned about networking or security. So I usually recommend to people, go talk to the people who are hiring, look at job postings, go to user group meetings if you have any in your area. If you don't have any in your area, start some user group meetings. Get those people in the room and find out if I wanted to do this in your organization, what would you need from me? And they'll tell you straight away what they want. Maybe maybe that's the best way to go about doing it. Thank you so much. I'll keep on uh, following you on those study groups. I enjoy so much. And uh, I'll inform more of my friends to I appreciate like that. You as, uh, Thank you. Thank you for calling. Here in Zambia who who likes your content. I appreciate so much for giving it free for us. Thank you so much. That's great to hear. Thank you. And you're very welcome. Absolutely glad to do it. And that's, I think, one of the greatest benefits of this very unusual business model that I have. Uh, my my family doesn't, my parents don't understand this. Watch, you you do the, the entire thing and you give it away. It takes you six months to build a course and then you just give it away. Well, yes. Well, we have other things wrapped around it that it will hopefully continue to bring in revenue so we can keep the lights on. But yeah, I love that that is a win-win, that anybody in the world can watch these, that I put closed captioning on all of them so that if uh, English isn't your first language, that you can still read along, you can catch. You don't Maybe you can't understand the word that I'm saying because the languages are so different, but you can read it and go, oh, that's, that's what he's saying. He's saying router, he's not saying router. I get it now. Maybe, maybe that's not the best example, but you know what I'm saying with those. So I think it's great that we're able to do that and that anybody in the world is able to get that training 
wherever they happen to be. Just a, a fantastic way to do it. Let's go back to the phones, which are blowing up. Oh, we've got the 330 area code. Are you there, caller? What's your name? Oh, um, hey, um, Professor Mester. Um, Marcus Arnett here again. Hello, Marcus. <laughs> Second time. Um, I actually passed my net plus last week. Um, right. I got a 766 on the test. Oh, and a good score, too. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Um, How's that feel? Yeah, the test was really yeah. stressful. It, it feels really good, actually, to <laughs> good. get out of the way. Um, it, it was fun taking the test and whatnot. Um, surprisingly, um, not that interactive, um, you know, performance-based questions compared to the A+, plus, but, you know, I mean... Uh I'm sort That's of, a little diesel, but yeah. So we're, we're, people are kind of saying that too. Is the A plus tends to have a lot more performance based questions than Network Plus. So they're saying word on the street, word gets around, guys talk, you hear things, kind of thing. Uh, that tends to be true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what can we do for um, you today? Um, yeah, a question I saw on the net plus was, um, it was a question about the command line. Um, I, I think it was command, a command line, um, command. It was called fast ethernet. It had like a slash zero slash. I think that was it or something like that. What is that used for? Well, we can't say too much about the exam because there is a candidate agreement that everybody signs that says we can't talk about the exam and one of the, any of the things on there. But I think I do understand what you're asking about. And it's something that I've heard people talk about on the Network Plus exam. I've even heard people talk about it on other study materials for Network Plus is that, um, and, and maybe this is a fault of our industry and how we think sometimes, is that a lot of Cisco-related nomenclature tends to filter its way into other parts of the industry, even when there's nothing Cisco-related about what we happen to be doing. But Cisco has become so ubiquitous. It is everywhere, it seems. If you've got a router or switch, you probably have Cisco somewhere in your network. And in some networks, you, you only have Cisco. Um, it, it's got a huge market presence. There are certainly other switches out there and other routers. You know, don't send, don't send me a lot of emails. I get it. Uh, but I'm someone who went around for years to other people's networks. And I would see how much third-party equipment happened to be there. And, uh, and there's a lot of Cisco out there. And so some of the Cisco naming conventions, people tend to see used in other places. In fact, other manufacturers of switches and routers have tended to use Cisco naming conventions because everybody is so familiar with Cisco. This is, this is just a weird monster that we've created with this. So if you look at an exam, I'll bring up an example. So I've got, for instance, uh, I've got some Cisco materials on my screen that I can step through and show you. And one of the ways that Cisco yeah. names their interfaces, for example, is they name them with the name of the interface, the slot where the interface happens to be, and the port number in that slot. In some cases, they even have a, diff a, a third number for the interface. There's a, a module type that's on there as well. Uh, so you do run into that with Cisco that there are these weird numbering naming conventions that they use. And they'll pop up on things like a CompTIA exam or even a CompTIA study material on the exam. And it's weird to see it that way because it's a convention that I don't use in any of my materials because it's nowhere in the CompTIA exam objectives. Nowhere in there does it say you need to know how to uh, view a Cisco router. That just doesn't even make sense at all. So I'm going to bring up, for instance, a diagram. You won't be able to see this on the phone, obviously, but I'm going to bring up the diagram so that other people can see it and you can always look. Is that uh, this is an IPv6 network with a bunch of routers. There's some routers and some switches. And so there's a serial link that's numbered SE030. It's actually SE0 slash 3 slash 0, which is a serial link on uh, the module 0 which is a, a, has a, a number three, a slot three, and an interface zero associated with it. That was actually maybe reversed on here. Uh, fast Ethernet, for instance, FA01. FA0 slash one is a fast Ethernet slot zero interface one. So it's telling you exactly where on the device that particular interface lives, where it exists. Um, it's a numbering and naming convention you don't see listed anywhere in the CompTIA exam objectives. Yet somehow, 
it finds itself into the exam. The question I have, of course, is does this mean that that question is one of those they give you on the exam that's not counted? Because they do this. I hate this, by the way. I don't agree with doing this. I understand why they do it. I just think it's wrong that they do it this way. But they ask questions on the exam that aren't graded. And they tell you this when you're about to take the exam, is that we're going to ask you something that you aren't expecting. But we want to see what your response is going to be. Maybe that's one of the questions. You don't know. Uh, or maybe they're expecting you to know the Cisco naming convention whenever you're looking at an exam or when you're ever looking at a network diagram which doesn't help me on the exam because you weren't telling me to expect that. Now, truth be told, uh, if you look at the exam objectives, they tell you in the objectives, this is we can ask questions that go outside the scope of this list. They don't have to stick to the objectives. So they have an out. They've given, they've given themselves a way to get around their own system. Um, I just don't think that's a good way to do it. If you're going to list out this huge set of details, I would really love it if you stayed to the details. And if you wanted me to know something else and you're giving me this much, why wouldn't you tell me everything? Um, maybe sometimes they're just they're just testing you to see what you would think. It's hard to know the answer to that, but that's probably what you saw given that bit of explanation that you provided already. Yeah, um, without going into much detail about what uh, I should say, um, one or two of the answers was about like physical like the physical um, OSI model layer with the, the actual port itself and the cable replacer or something like that. Yeah, that's of course, those types of things are covered in the exam objectives. And in that case, we could, of course, expect to see that type of scenario. But uh, it's one of those challenges. You just never know if that question is something they're testing out. Maybe they think a lot of people know what they're asking. Or maybe they want to see what your response will be to see if they should be adding this in the next version of the network. Plus, you just never know. Yeah. Um, thanks for the explanation on that. Um, I, I was surprised to actually think about it was actually a Cisco proprietary um, kind of um, service. But yeah, again, like VTN and all that sort of stuff is Cisco proprietary. So. I mean, I think it's more of the vendor neutral kind of thing where it covers all the sort of vendors that you'll come across, Microsoft, Cisco, all that sort of stuff, just cover all the bases. It, it could be, although I, I think that if you're going to ask a question uh, on an exam like this, that people should be prepared for the, ex the question that you're going to ask. I don't think there's any good reason to trip people up to ask questions that are outside the scope of what you told them would be on the exam. I think they really should focus on what's on their exam objectives and stick to it. Um, it it's more of a CompTIA thing than anything else. My, I tell people that if you know everything on the exam objectives, even if they happen to ask a couple of questions that are outside the scope, it doesn't matter. If you know everything on the exam objectives, you're going to pass. At least that's the way they're, they, they offer these questions in the test today. So uh, just focus on the exam objectives. If they ask something off the beaten path, you can just guess at it and keep it moving. As long as you know what's on the exam objectives, you're going to pass your exam. Yeah. Um, yeah, I pretty much knew all the objectives on there. I knew the OSI model layer. I knew, I knew pretty much all the objectives on there. I learned about them through stuff like um, all an expert with them. Um, yeah, I think I, I use the same exact sources for um, a, a plus I, as I use for the net plus, you know, all an expert tool seminars, you know, all that sort of stuff. I think it's the best way to do it. I think it's a good strategy, and it, it seems to have worked out for you. Yeah, use all kinds of sources, um, use all sorts of sources that, um, to actually, you know, know about stuff. Have, um, like for, um, you know, taking the actual practice exam, um, use different sorts. Use um, different tests, you know, just to see if um, the warden is what you're trying to answer. And that's, yep. you know, the actual yummy. I agree. Okay. As much Q&A as possible. Get your hands on as many books as possible. Watch as many much video content as possible. A lot of different sources that are a lot of different kinds, I think, can only help you on the exam. So congratulations again. I'm glad to hear you had a good success with that. Yep, I'm now move on to Security Plus. So nice. that's gonna be a long that's gonna be a long road trip ahead. Um, um so far on that I've um encountered um 
some of the it's not really more technological it's more based on um business kind of um terminology um like uh, i can't I'm trying to remember stuff here but um just use with um uh, yep it is like risk management it is it security yeah. is about uh 75 percent networking and then 25% is the security piece that's layered on the top of it. Uh, you have to, if you're going into IT security, you need to be very, very good with your networking side of things. But then there's this whole other world of processes, procedures, security technologies, things that are very specific to IT security that you never run into on the networking side that deal with IPsec and certificates and encryption and, uh, and technologies. Uh, it comes much more of a challenge to Put all those pieces together there's nothing as cohesive as they're in on those other sides so it's it's a really fun certification to go through you learn a lot and i think when you combine that with the networking you're in good shape yeah i think the best part would be the cryptonology um aspect of um security plus that actually looks pretty fun Just i think it is too well good team. luck with that let us know how it goes and if other questions come up you can always call into the security plus study group all right um yeah, I'll start. Yeah, I'll start using a lot more sources outside of um, tool seminars and all, and um, online expert. I'll probably use yours, honestly. You seem. I'll experiment with yours. Try to see if um, that'll work. You know, experimentation with um, studying basically. Sounds perfect. Thanks, Marcus, and thanks for the call. And we will see you on the Security Plus side. Yep, you too. That's one of the great things about this is that they all build on each other. Uh, once you get the networking piece down, Security Plus is just layered on top. Uh, comes in handy to have that there. Let's go to the 626 area code. And uh, caller, what's your name? Hi, it's Greg, Professor Messer. How are you? Hey, Greg, doing good. What can we do you for? I uh, just uh, wanted to run down real quick. Um, I had a question, but let me give you the backstory first. Um, I've been on IT for about 18 years. And... Uh, banking, you name it, and uh, here in the Los Angeles area. And uh, a couple of years ago, I sustained a severe nerve injury to my right hand Ouch. and uh, elbow. And uh, yeah, it's due to the injury occurred at one, um, I was contracting at a specific location for about a year and a half, sustained the injury, but kept working. But they sent me to PT and, you know, physical therapy yep. and saw the doctor. And uh, so they after my assignment was over, they uh, put me on permanent dis or work its comp. And uh, long story short, um, I don't use a right hand mouse anymore. I learned how to use a left hand mouse. Wow, good and, for you. And uh, typing, yeah, it. I had to because you know answering, <clears throat> answering um, fifty to eighty calls a day uh, took its toll, and they weren't using the correct software. And that put on about 40% more clicking and, uh, you know, just, it's just nerve damage. It's beyond carpal tunnel. That really wasn't, there was no injury, but so my question is now, and that was all first line it first line. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I'm looking for something. If, if I can go back, uh, should I get my network plus, um, to, to, was there a lot of typing involved? I mean, configuring switches? I'm, I'm, is, I'm limited now. Permanent and stationary is what the mark me has. Right. Uh, I'm, I am sorry to hear about that. This is one of the things in our industry that are incredibly challenging is that there there is a lot of repetition uh, when you get into things like uh, – uh, in some aspects of networking, there was, and, and even security, a lot of heavy lifting. Um, and, and we often don't even think about what we're doing with it. I myself have moved to a mouse th that is just enormous. Many of you probably can see it on here, which is a, a hand, I think you call it the hand shoe mouse. I mean, it's just this huge uh, device that's, it, it's, it's enormous. But it's designed so you place your hand, your entire hand on it. Your your whole arm ends up being the mouse because I do so much clicking and so much typing that you start to yeah. feel it at the end of the day. And these are these are significant things See we need to, to know about in our industry and being able to work through it. One of the things about IT, though, 
and it's probably true in, in both the networking side and on the security side, once you get out of sort of answering the phones kind of thing, you that you don't have to deal a lot with a heavy clicking and heavy typing. Uh, you, jobs that are even something like um, uh, being able to work through networking troubleshooting isn't as bad as you might think on the mouse clicking side, although there does tend to be a lot of clicking on the keyboard side. So a lot of this may depend on the type of job that you're in and who you're working for. When you're working for a company that it's a, a managed service provider, a lot of the times, and you probably saw this, it's about how quickly you can get through the calls. How quickly can you get this thing done? Yeah. Uh, how, how It's speed, 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 speed. Uh, but when you get into other environments like a environment that is, um, uh, I, I think of one like a state and local government is a good example, where it's more of how do we make this technology work given a limited number of resources? And it's not so much about can we do it fast, but can we do it right? And I like those environments because first, it's a little more laid back. Having to walk into state and local government was always a nice, relaxing talk with folks because they were trying to solve a different set of problems for people that wasn't life-threatening. Their job was not evaluated based on how quickly they could get anything done. But it was really based more on we have a limited number of resources how can we be more, as as creative as possible? It used more of their brain oh, than it did anything else. So those might be a good opportunity exactly. to to look into those types of positions too. You might also see some like that with nonprofit organizations. Uh, I've worked closely with uh, nonprofit organizations that build buildings for people. They build houses for people. I've worked with others that are uh, like uh, cancer research organizations. That's another one where they're more focused on solving a bigger problem than they are how fast you can get something done. Um, and of course, you can also think about freelancing, uh, doing development work and programming, writing your own iPhone app. There's so many different things where you can even be your own boss. Um, and that's one of the things I like about what I do is I do this full time. This is what I do. I come into this room. You talked. You, you mentioned uh, you are stationary. You are not. Sit, you're not going anywhere. Well, that's me. I sit in this chair and I type on the screen or I create the content that I create. I do a video and I put it online. Anybody can do that. So that might be a opportunity for you to think about more creative ways to take technology. And being able to use it in a way that works for you, and and like like I've seen here, I've kind of created a business model that's very different than anything else. Everybody said this is a model that would never work, and it's just gone gangbusters. So one of the things I I always tell people is, I uh, wait for somebody to tell you no, you can't do that. And what that really means is we've never thought of that before. And if nobody's ever thought of that before, that's exactly what you should be doing. So there may be some ideas that you already have in your brain about how you can make something happen. I started this company 10 years ago, working part time. Uh, I go to my day job and then at night I would do this. And I did that for about seven years. So it takes a while to ramp this up. But once you get there, you kind of control your own destiny. And maybe that's something you should consider as well. Yeah, I have an idea. I'll PM you later on it, um, just on those lines. But going back to the left hand mouse, you know, when I was still taking calls just to give my hand a rest, you know, I said, well, this isn't happening because I, I can't operate a left hand mouse. But after about a month, it was, uh, it's pretty cool. I'm almost as fast as, uh, as my right. Isn't that remarkable? Not, I'm right hand dominant. So it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Your body will adapt. And, um, but, uh, yeah, I, I want to get my network plus, um, because I never got my A plus. The, the the big thing that I liked, even though people go, well, you spent so many years in first line, but I, well, I got promoted at one bank position to purchasing and got laid off. They brought me back as a contractor, back to IT right. for conversions for eight months. And then, you know, I've been contracting ever since, but I loved, I still do love talking to people. So I always stayed in first line. You know, I was making... 25 to 30 dollars an hour but i just love talking to people you got to do what you like you got to do what you like yeah and that's one of the beautiful yeah. things i think of it is that there's so many different things you can do i spent 
a huge part of my career as a field systems engineer, usually on the sales side. So it's pre-sales engineering, which means there would usually be paired up with me and, a, and an account manager. We would go visit our customers and they would say, we got this problem we're trying to accomplish. Can you do that? And then we would say, yes, we can, or no, we can't, or here's how we can make it happen. And then my job was technically trying to make that happen. And I loved the challenge associated with that, but it required a lot of travel. I'm a, I'm a Delta million miler. I've been around the world doing this wow. kind of job, literally around the world doing this, but it took an enormous amount of time away from home, uh, enormous amount of time away from my family. And I tell other people, this is what I do. And they go, wow, I could never do that. But they're in a position when we're visiting them where they are working in a hospital or they're working with state and local government or they're working with a, a an outsourcing company or they're doing cloud computing. They're doing all these other things. They're making soda. They're making they're making pop. Uh, you know, it's just a company. That's what they do. Um, it, it There's always somewhere you can find that fits with your personality and what you're trying to do in IT. And it's one of the things I tell people is the great equalizer of this business is that if you're doing something you just don't like so much, there's another job in IT. It's very similar to what you're doing that probably might fit you even better. And you can slide right into it because you already know 50%, 60%, 75% of what you should know in that job. And of course, with something like this YouTube that we're on right now, um, it didn't exist when I got into IT. So you never know what's happening in the next 10 years of what's coming along next that's going to fit perfectly with where you're trying to move yourself as well. I think that's one of the beautiful things about this industry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So would I guess the question is, would it be a good idea to um, continue on with Network Plus certification and just see what it takes me from there? Or is there going to be a lot of lifting or as you mentioned, I don't. I don't. It, it, the amount of lifting involved usually de is very dependent on where you go with Network Plus. Usually, it's putting the box in the rack is your hardest problem. And in a big organization, you have people to do that for you. So a lot of the people that I worked with that were ne network administrators never actually touched the equipment. In very large organizations, you weren't even allowed to touch the equipment. Uh, you had other people in the data center. Their responsibility was to put it in the rack. Your responsibility was to configure it. So it, it just depends on the scenario you're fine. So you'll, you'll probably have to be a little more picky than others along those lines. One of the things I like about Network Plus, and although uh, the answer to the question is I can't answer it because everybody has their own plan of what they would like to do. But I think in IT, the more you know about the network, the more you can do really almost everything else better. You can develop and program better. You can set up your servers better. You can configure your security equipment much better. You can manage your databases much better. You can install load balancers better because you know exactly how the network operates. I think the more you know about the yeah. network, um, and I, I may be saying this because that's where I really got excited about technologies when I, I learned that there were packets that I could read uh, and I could look at protocol decodes and I knew exactly what was going on in the network. Like it was like the matrix. They could they could read that screen and understand exactly what was going on or reading an EKG, a heart monitor, and knowing exactly what part of the heart was the problem. I could read through protocol decodes and I got to where I could find, I could see the problem it would pop up in the protocol decode. That's some good stuff right there. I could sit in a chair. I could plug into the network. I could watch the protocols go by. I didn't have to type anything. It was doing all the protocols. I tell it to stop, and then I could just read through them and figure out those pieces. There are people I know uh, that are good friends of mine. That's all they do for a living is look through protocol decodes. So it can absolutely be done, and it's an exciting, interesting job. You're you're trying to solve a lot of very complex problems, de dealing with, in, in many cases, very expensive problems, and you're able to see everything happening across the network. Uh, it's, it's remarkable what you're able to do with some networking knowledge. Yeah, exactly. Well, I appreciate it, Professor Messer. I continue to study with your your channel and I, I do want to set my is it important to set a test date first or <laughs> that depends or on your network plus I, I it depends on your personality I know some people that will never take their exam unless they set a date I'm the kind of person who won't set the date until I'm absolutely sure I'm ready to take it so I think it really depends on what what drives you uh, if you must have a date well, that, that gets you there, that's fine. And keep in mind, you can move the date. I think you have 
24 or 48 hours before the exam. You can push it. You can change the date. It's not like it's locked in stone and you are okay. you have to do that. You could get close to it in a week out and think, oh, I am nowhere close to taking this exam. Let's push it out a month and, and reset. So you can absolutely well, I, do that. That's, that's what I did. That's what I did. I did. I took the real estate exam 10, 12 years ago, and I passed the first time. But I studied and got a tutor for three months. Yep. And after... After my shift at my IT job, I go into computer operations where it's completely quiet until two in the morning for three months and just study. Yep. And, uh, and that's the I only way to do it. Because I, yeah, yeah, it's um, it's just the unknown. You know, it's really kind of scary at times, but uh, but isn't it that way with anything that you get that. into with IT especially and and certification exams to some degree I will sit down on a new exam because I just finished writing a, a set of Cisco stuff uh, getting into that I took my Cisco certification and passed it but did I really know everything that was on the exam and it's kind of scary walking in unless you do but once you step through everything you're like oh that was it well I now that I understand it that's nothing so it was really me worrying for no good reason, if I just spent the time to understand it, the fear goes away, and then you can concentrate on actually taking the exam and passing it. That's where my tutor came in because I I learned by doing, not by reading. If I see it first, then read about it, then it makes a yep. whole lot of sense. I think most That's people just, are like that. You know, oh my God, I just videos are so great now. It's the way to go. Well, good luck, Greg. Let us know how it goes yeah, and where you go with it, and uh, I'd love to hear where the where the story goes. Sure thing. I'll, I'll uh, send you um, shoot you a PM on that idea I had. It's pretty cool. Perfect. You know. Yeah, and you could if, <laughs> if anybody ever wants to send anything to me, if you click the contact us link at the top or the bottom of my website, it goes straight to my phone. So I'm the, I'm the one who gets all of those. So if anybody ever needs to send me anything, that's a great way to do it. Awesome. Great. Thank you, sir. Best of luck. Have a, thank you. Have a nice day. You too. That's a, that's always a challenge. I work with a lot of people in IT that had uh, either challenges associated with them being able to do their job. Um, I worked with a gentleman who had uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, and he was at our help desk. He was... Um, and, and he was not able to use his arms or legs. He was in a, a wheelchair and he was able to take calls and work on the help desk and put tickets in and do amazing things, even with the, uh, even with the situation that he was in. So I know if he can do that, that anybody should be able to find something relating to technology that they could work through. Because we've all got challenges, whether they're physical or mental or personalities. There's always things we work better with. Some people work better with people. Some people prefer not to work with people. Some people work better on certain technologies and not others. Um, that's one of the benefits. I, another benefit of IT, I think, is that you've got complete flexibility on what you can do and where you can go with this. I think it's a, a good way to approach it as well. Yeah, I was pretty surprised on, on the call from uh, that there were so many calls he was getting in a single day. It's remarkable uh, being able to work through all of those. So that's one where, um, and I like that I'm able to do this and it works into the things that I work best doing. So figure it out. Uh, nothing ever happens unless you make it happen. You have to put together a plan. The plan for me sitting here doing this right now was a plan I created 10 years ago. It took five or six years to really get to a point where things started to pick up and really only two years ago able to quit my day job. So really only doing this full time, about two and a half years at this point. So nothing is overnight, but you have to set a plan up. Where do I want to be and what do I want to do? Because you can do it, but you have to know how to get there. It has to be a good plan. I could just say, well, I'm going to make videos. Off we go. Okay, yes, but children need food and they need clothing and they need shelter. And so do I. So how do we make that happen? And you can figure it out. There's plenty of ways to do it. If you have questions, just ask me and being able to work through it. Um, I like, uh, and I had a full-time job in doing all of that. Yes, uh, 
full time job for that that time frame and making that happen, writing books, creating video courses. When the end of the day came, I think traveling was really the thing that enabled me to do that. Is that I would fly off to some far off land. You do everything you do during the day. This job I hap I happened to do was really during business hours. So I would go see customers in the morning. We take some to lunch. We go see customers in the afternoon. Maybe set up a lab. Uh, do a, a, a proof of concept, get things running. And then at five o'clock, everybody went home. Like we, I wasn't involved. I was pre-sales. We weren't in the production part of the network. Okay, let's go home, everybody. Except I have calls the next day in that city. I go to a hotel. So I go to my hotel room. It's six o'clock. I've already had a Chick-fil-A sandwich. Now what do I do with the rest of the night? Well, why don't I make some content? So I'd sit on my laptop and I create videos and con I would create the content and then I would go home on the weekend, shoot the video, edit, and then go back on the road again. It's about time management. It's about doing the right things at the right time and getting those going. Um, and having, and I was able to create a library. For A plus was the first one I did. Then I did a network plus. Then I did security plus. Then I did the Microsoft. Then I created course notes. Then I created pop quiz collection. Now we're off to Cisco. Now I've got other things planned. Um, just keep creating the content. Have a plan in place. Is the plan that I created 10 years ago exactly what I am running now? No, it's close. But it's not exactly because you'll tweak things as you go. You'll make changes to the plan as you go. Some things we did, I did a podcast with uh, Mrs. Professor Messer. We thought we'd be able to do some interesting things there. It was a bust. We didn't make any money on our podcast. We designed it so that we could it ended up being an interesting experiment. But we used what we learned to create these live streams. So it's even though something seems like an abject failure, like that did not go well at all. I hit the wall at full speed, bam, and fell over backwards. But during the process of doing that, you learn that you can apply some of these things to the next step. So, and that's the way it always works. When something doesn't work right, especially in business, uh, that was, you sh you're never going to learn unless you get it wrong. And as soon as you get it wrong, okay, I know what I can, I can do this now. I got, I can change this. We're going to do it this way. We'll put it into this and we'll create this. And there you go. And you just keep going. Just keep doing that. Just keep tweaking it. Well, we've come to the end of another hour with all of these, I want to thank you for your phone calls. I want to thank you for participating in the Q&A that we had during the first hour, for just attending, being in the chat room. I welcome your calls, your letters, your messages. You're welcome to hit the Contact Us link at the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website throughout the month. If you have any questions, I try to get back with every single one of you when there are questions that come through. Just so you can know, here's what I think of the thing that you've got that you sent me and maybe you have other questions about our products as well. I'd be glad to tell you about those too. Thanks for joining us on the study group. We've got another one of these planned for next month. Check the calendar for the next event and we will see you next time on the Network Plus study group.